welcome to another episode of Meet the Author at Your Library. Tonight's guest is Laura Hayden, and she's going to discuss her book, Staying Alive, A Love Story. She's also a professor at Nantuck Community College, and I really thought tonight she should have it on her class night so all of her students could come, because if I was certainly one of her students, I'd be attending tonight just for any of the extra brownie points she might get for attending. But Laura's book is absolutely wonderful, and we're thrilled that she's here to speak with us tonight. Thank you. amazed at the many different people from many different parts of my life who are here tonight, starting with my family, with um, friends who I worked with at Fermi High School through many years, former students, uh, a number of friends from the Western Connecticut State University program where um, the book that I'm reading from tonight was actually my MFA thesis. I know that sounds so academic, but it was uh, MFA in creative nonfiction, so you get to write <laughs> creative writing. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazingly moved by that. Um, I always have a mixed emotion at a reading like this. I haven't done very many, but I am thrilled to be here. And at the same time, I wish I wasn't reading the piece that I'm reading because it is a memoir of loss and it uh, centers around the death of my husband 13 years ago. It seems like quite a long time. And um, at the same time, I feel that the memoir did uh, come to be a book not only about loss, but about joy as well. And I hope that the pieces that I've chosen tonight uh, indicate that to you. It's hard to uh, rely on just one essay. It's called a memoir. I call it linked essays. You could read them in any order, though I suggested an order by putting them in the order that they're in. Uh, but really, each one is unto itself, and you know, now the English teacher in me is going to talk. Linked essays at the same time linked to each other, so if you read the whole book, you might look for that theme. <laughs> uh, do this. this is the book, Staying Alive, A Love Story. Uh, it's on TV being zoomed into right now, so I'm going to uh, give it its due. Uh, the person who designed the cover is here tonight, I have to say that, Dale Ulrich and, Ulrich, and I love the cover. If you have read the book, the cover is perfect, okay? So now you really have to read the book to see why the cover is so perfect. We all set with that? Okay. Um, I'm going to take bits and pieces here and there, reading you, first of all, the first two pages of the book. Um, the essay is entitled, Losing. Larry was the first to spot the three dolphins moving parallel to a shoreline under the dry California sun. One of the dolphins seemed to lead the slow progress of the other two. Another, lodged the, an, another nudged the third through the rippling waters with its head. The dolphin being pushed floated dorsal side up. It soon became clear that the upturned dolphin was dead. This behavior was no quirk for the bottlenose dolphin, a Reuters piece tells a story about a dolphin that worked for hours in a busy Florida waterway to revive her dead calf. She pushed the calf and would come up beneath her trying to get her to move, said a female worker at the bait shop on the bank of the Alafia River. Another eyewitness reported the dolphin wouldn't let anyone get near the calf. Bottlenose dolphins often spend two or three days mourning their dead before abandoning them. We stood frozen on the edge of the water that day. The procession moved so slowly that hours later, when we were back in our car, driving no more than a mile or so up the Canyon Hills Highway, we caught sight of, a, of the saltwater entourage again as it continued steadily up the Pacific to who knows where. Four months later, Emily, Connor, and I escorted our Larry to his grave. If I was to continue reading that chapter, it would it would chronicle the day that Larry died. Uh, the next few chapters chronicle the days, a few days that followed. The book doesn't uh, stop there, though. It goes back in time, which happens through the next few essays, and it comes up to the present as well. One entire section, essay, chapter, whatever you want to call it, is devoted to my daughter and one is devoted to my son's experience. Um, 
Emily's essay is called Backlash, and Connor's essay is called Slow Motion. Emily was 13 at the time, Connor was 11. And um, both of them were <laughs> great resources in doing this work. I was uh, very cognizant of not wanting to speak for them, so I spoke with them a lot, and um, they were very helpful through it. I was going to read part of uh, my son's essay tonight, because my daughter, I knew, was going to be here, and I figured, well, it's kind of like embarrassing or whatever to, to read about, to be sitting there while people are reading about you. So I was all set to read about Connor, and then Connor walked into the kitchen tonight. <laughs> but he's just going to have to suck it up. <laughs> start with the first paragraph of this and then go deeper into the essay. Slow motion. Connor wasn't prepared to become the man of the house after Larry died. He was ready to have his father show him how to set screens on a basketball court. He was ready to follow the Yukon men's march to the Big East Championship in 99. The playoffs would have been Connor's first trip to Madison Square Garden with Larry, young follower and seasoned fan. The next part of that essay goes back to Connor's birth. Uh, actually, it goes back to his conception. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, moves and then moves forward specifically uh, through him as a young child. And um, then up to the time when he did, uh, when, when we lost Larry. And that's the place that I'm picking up with right now. Immediately after Larry died, Emily and Connor began sleeping with me in the upstairs master bedroom. It was a grand room, an addition we had put on the small ranch by raising the roof two years earlier. Twice the size of our downstairs bedroom, which Emily took over, yet cozy. There was a TV and love seat on the east side and sliding doors that led to the high deck where two could sit and wish on the stars before slipping into bed on the west. When the renovation was complete around our 17th anniversary, the children framed two handmade signs to decorate the new room. M, 11 at the time, boldly print No Kids Zone over a splashy red, green, and yellow background. We just found that sign the other day. Connor, two years younger, drew the black outline of a smiley face, a little rough on the edges, and overlaid it with a thick red circle crossed by a diagonal line. For a while after Larry died, I was wake up facing the sliding door, turn over, still half asleep, and reach out, expecting to find him by my side. The vacancy under my searching hand fully awakened me to the reality of missing him. There was some comfort upon rising to see Emily and Connor stretched out on their air mattresses by my bed, still asleep, and in that moment, wrapped in their cartoon character bedding, insulated from the reality of their loss. In a week or so, as Christmas drew closer, we decorated the upstairs with tiny red poinsettia lights around the windows, a festive touch the children needed. On December 24th, we watched what we always watched with Larry on that night, Christmas on Sesame Street, Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. The show was already 20 years old, and Mr. Hooper, the shopkeeper who saved the day in our favorite skit, had actually died before my children were born. Yet there he was, forever captured in the segment where Bert sells his paperclip collection to Mr. Hooper to buy Ernie a soap dish for his rubber ducky, and Ernie sells rubber ducky to Mr. Hooper to buy Bert a cigar box for his paperclip collection. As I watched Mr. Hooper return the prized possessions to the best buddies, in honor of their selflessness, I realize that Larry will always remain young and vital in my children's eyes. As my hair grays, my mind weakens, and my body fails, their memory of their father will always be the father they had when they were 11 and 13 years old. Just after Christmas, Emily returned to her bedroom, where she had more privacy and her own cordless phone. Connor stayed upstairs, even after he went back to school after the holiday break. You can stay up here with me as long as you need to, I told him early in the new year. I'll stay to Valentine's Day, he said, surprising me with his quiet, quick, exact reply. As long as you need to, I repeated. We never spoke about it again, but on February 13th, I noticed his Toy Story blanket was missing from the upstairs room. 
His Buzz Lightyear toy was gone, too. He had brought them downstairs and was busy tucking corners at the bottom of his bunk. Then he placed Buzz under those covers. On Valentine's Day morning, he woke up in his own bed. His heartache, like his infant colic, was beginning to remedy itself. Connor got past his colic and delayed speech, the way the fabled tortoise outran the hare, slowly but steadily. He reminded us more of Ferdinand the Bull when he first stepped on the soccer field. Where is he, I would ask, as dust settled around a pile of fumbling five-year-olds, all too young to have developed any finesse in the game. Over there, Larry would point to a quiet corner of the field where Connor was sat picking dandelions. Once he moseyed off a tad farther and sat on a swing in the playground by the field. He had twisted the chains above him and then lifted his feet. As his team made a goal, he spun in delight. By second grade, Connor started to bust chops on the soccer field. I remember the day I watched Larry and Connor through the kitchen window as one pair of large and one pair of small feet danced around the black and white ball. I heard Connor ask his father, who's your favorite painter? The question took Larry by surprise, not so much for its content, but for the context in which it was asked, just as the seven-year-old was about to steal the ball. The first three words, who's your favorite, spilled out just as Connor stopped the moving ball and pulled it back out of his father's reach. The last word, painter, popped out, of Connor's, out at the start of Connor's trademark two-step, an awesome move in which the boy seemed to step with both feet atop the ball, momentarily balance upon it, and then aim his body and the ball a half turn away. In a flash, he dribbled the ball past his outwitted opponent. My favorite painter? Hmm, mused his father as he shook his head over this deal. Sherwin Williams, he decided, <laughs> raising one eyebrow as he spoke. <laughs> My name's Claude Monet, said Connor, as he kicked the stitched sphere across the yard into a makeshift goal. His father's mouth gaped open in surprise. How is it that an aspiring World Cup contender brings up a 19th century artist as nonchalantly as he might invoke Alexi Lawless, the land of Donovan in the mid-90s. I had a pretty good idea. When I helped out in his classroom earlier that week, I had noticed a hazy picture of sky, water, and rocks taped onto the blackboard by the window. Afternoon on the Rhine was printed in chalk above it, Claude Monet, 1840 to 1926, Impressionism below. The seven-year-old students were being introduced to the world of art appreciation. Image and words had been absorbed by Connor's brain, ready to ooze out at any time, including a spontaneous backyard soccer spree. You know, Monet's one of my favorites, too, Larry offered. He walked over to retrieve the ball. In fact, there's a picture in Mom and Dad's room. He tossed the ball a short distance to his son. It's a Monet print. This time, Connor's mouth fell agape. He dropped the soccer ball onto the grass, ran into the breezeway, and then right past me in the kitchen, down to our down the hall to our bedroom. Sure enough, above the night table hung a print that seemed to emit its own light in the dark corner. A half dozen tiny white ducks swam in the foreground. Rippling circles bounced off the brood across shimmering green-gold waters. In the low, lower cor corner, the signature Claude Monet, 74, identified the artist. Cool, said Connor. He saw the ducks and his father in a new light. A few weeks later, I returned home from shopping to find father and son shooting hoops in the driveway. The random replay of Connor's young mind pitched another question, his dad's way. Who's your favorite impressionist? Larry, who had his mind on a corner shot he was about to make from a chalk-drawn foul line, replied rather automatically, Rich Lil. <laughs> Neither of them heard me laugh. Mine's Andrew Wyatt, said Connor. He was thinking back to his second grade field trip to the Mead Museum on the Amherst College campus the day before. There he had seen Monet's original Morning on the Seine, Giverny, with its misty mood and lavender flavor, along with Hopper, Pollock, O'Keefe, and Wyatt paintings. It didn't matter that this young art critic had gotten his periods mixed up. From now on, the elegance in the arc of a basketball on its trajectory to a rimless swish would coexist in his mind with timeless objects of art. I like the way he painted lace curtains blowing through the window just before the, core, the storm, Connor said. They look so real, 
like a photograph. They did, did they, said his father, watching the ball swish through the hoop. You know, Connor, we have to take a trip, he continued, retrieving the ball, going up for a shot and missing. There's a great art museum with lots of paintings up at Williams College. Sure, when Williams asked Connor, after the rebound. <laughs> it's so good to hear you laugh at this. <laughs> that is by no means the end of that essay. Uh, but I think maybe you can see it coming that um, just of that essay is that father, uh, that Connor has very much become very much like his father and uh, grown into the role very, very wonderfully. Um, the next piece I'm going to read you is a little bit longer and it's, a, it's an entire essay. It comes after essays about, oh, many things. <laughs> uh, you know, we are talking 13 years here. Um, at one point I moved from uh, Enfield to a small house in Windsor Locks. Um, the children grew up, they went to school, they went to college. Uh, I also uh, found that, and there will be a little mention of this in uh, the essay that I'm going to read, that the book really made me recognize that, uh, you know, we, we are kind of filled with our losses and there's a uh, as I was finishing the memoir, finishing the program, um, uh, my father had died many years ago, and my mother died, and there's a essay devoted to him and her. But they all link, remember? <laughs> okay. But uh, I'm going to the next to the last piece, which is a little edgier. It has one bad word in it. I don't see any under edge <laughs> Hey, you've got to be careful of those things. Okay. And it's called Not Ready for Prime Time Humors. I love Jay Leno, but not because he tells great jokes. Letterman's gags usually top his repartee, like in their birthday shout-outs to Obama a few years ago. Leno. If you want to get him a present, he's registered at Bed Bath and Blaine Bush. Yeah. Letterman. He'll be 49 years old. Yeah, right, if he had a birth certificate. Give me subtle, over-obvious, any late night. It's Leno's profile that sends me, his chin to be exact. That chin of his before the Tonight Show gig when he made the cover of People magazine in 87 is the same chin that man of mine had. When Larry was in college, his roommate drew a two-inch caricature of him, one-third head, two-thirds chin, angling down from his jaw to the tip of his stick figure feet. Jutting all right, so much so that when the anvil-faced comedian, as people dubbed Jay, Took over for Carson in 92. Friends urged Larry, send your picture to Leno. Maybe you'll get invited on the show. How protruding was Larry's chin? So protruding. And if that man of mine had made it past his 49th birthday, had lived long enough to send NBC that picture, making him an even more prime target for Leno lookalike jokes, the way Obama at 49 was a prime target for birth certificate jokes, that chin of his would have had to have been broken. That's right, intentionally cracked and reset by a guy who cracks and resets jaws for a living so that my man's upper molars would have finally been able to rest upon his lower molars, not slip into a chasm of jaw that thrust his lower mandible forward. All of this breaking and resetting would of course have occurred after Larry's would-be guest appearance on The Tonight Show after his 15 minutes of fame jawing with Jay. But Larry got way more than 15 minutes of fame without having to be like anybody else. The day he died, word spread through town so quickly that by the time I called to pass the tragic news on to my high school principal at four in the afternoon, after my children were back home and after our house had filled with shell-shocked family and friends, the principal had already reported the sorry account at a faculty meeting two hours earlier. An EMT leak, I suspect. And before the early December sun had gone down on that dark, dark day, the president of the Town Soccer Association stopped by my home to pay his respects and generously offered to have the sports club cater the meal that would follow Larry's funeral. It's the least we could do, he said, as I nodded the way I nodded through countless condolences at Larry's wake two nights later, like a bobblehead through, oh, I'm sorry like a bobblehead through hours and hours of sympathy from a line of mourners that looped within the room, through the lobby, and out the funeral home door. 
One expression of empathy spoken by a soccer mom whose daughters had been coached by Larry for as long as our daughter and son had played the sport, seven years I'd say, seemed the most fitting. She wrapped me in her arms and whispered, this sucks, in my ear. Others were sweet, let's get together and bake Christmas cookies next week. I couldn't imagine rolling dough and adding sprinkles to snowmen and angels in seven days or 7,000. Maybe David Letterman should deliver a top 10 list of what not to say to a young widow. I could suggest a few doozies. Please don't say God has a plan or God needed him in heaven. That's one nasty almighty that would take a father away from his family in the snap of time it takes to listen to this sentence. The time it takes for a clock to travel like too long. That's it. Bye-bye. The family show over. Another one for Dave's list, don't even think about attesting to the woman's strength by saying, better you than me. A widow can really pave the road to hell with that one. But do ching <laughs> Letterman's a lucky guy. He had quintuple bypass surgery a year after Larry died. Six weeks later, he returned to his desk on late night and featured eight members of his medical team on the show. They installed an easy pass, he joked, though obviously moved by the gift of his regained wellness. Larry and 59,999 others didn't get through the recovery toll booth in the year between his surgery and Letterman's due to a blood clot traffic jam in his lung. He missed out on the opportunity to read Jay's autobiography, Leading With My Chin, which became available just after his death. I'm sure he would have been interested to know that Jay's doctors advised him to have his jaw broken, too. I can hear Larry saying, Leno wouldn't even need a surgeon. Conan O'Brien would do it for free. <laughs> but Leno says he doesn't want to go through the prolonged healing period with his jaws wired shut. Can you blame him, especially after last year's ordeal? I, for one, am thrilled that Leno will let his jaw be even if its non-alignment could lead to chewing issues in its, his old age, headaches even. As long as Jay keeps his jaw the way it is, I can be reminded of Larry's jaw the way it was, the way it would have been. I'm not alone in the infatuation either. Google Jay Leno's chin and you get 245 hits. Young Leno with thick curly hair, thin face, a pointy chin. Middle-aged Leno with a more stylized pompadour, jaw thicker, more protruding. Leno at 60 with a silver gray mane and fleshy jowls. That's what the good life will do to you. Funny, I can't even write about late night TV without writing about Larry. I have been writing about Larry's death for some time now. I tried to about write about my life five, ten years after losing him, and those pieces always reverted back to his passing. Then I tried to write about our lives together before losing him, and those pieces always led up to the loss. I realized if I was going to write, it was in one way or another going to be about Larry's death. Grief becomes its own obsession. Writing about the obsession comes from me finally admitting that that day Larry died would spill into part of every day I would live for the rest of my life. And in so doing, I became aware that my father's death before Larry died and my mother's after had become a part of my every day as well. I think as we get older, we get filled with our losses. A year or so before Larry died, a dear friend of mine lost her husband. She was an older woman, now also gone, who had been my religious instruction teacher when I was younger, and then became a very close colleague after we started teaching high school together. So close, she threw me a bridal shower. My dear friend and her husband, an English teacher and an engineer, were married for over 50 years. She often told me how on their many long trips together she would look up and admire the clouds while he would look up and admire the telephone poles. <laughs> on one of those long road trips, he suffered a stroke. She lost her loving passenger. When Larry died, my friend comforted me comforted me by telling me her grief was like having a hole in her heart. Not the cliché broken heart, though recent studies indicate a survivor can die of the proverbial broken heart, but a heart with a part of it missing. She never mentioned this when Larry was alive. It was a story the bereaved tells the grieving. The hole in the heart image has stayed with me ever since. An adult or child can literally have a hole in their heart, a simple congenital heart defect, and still live. I think this is a crucial aspect of the metaphor. Recently, a Connecticut doctor whose wife and daughters were heinously killed three years ago spoke after one of the murderers was sentenced to death. The state and since the verdict, 
The nation have watched Dr. William Pettit and his close relatives endure the trial with dignified, sanguine anguish. When the doctor did speak publicly, and this was a couple years ago, after the sentencing, he was asked if he finally felt some closure now that the judgment was passed. He mulled a bit. This was not part of his planned statement. Then he said, I don't think there is closure. I think whoever came up with that, comp that concept is an imbecile, whoever they are who wrote it the first time. I think that assessment comes from the doctor side of William Pettit, the endocrinologist, and it makes me wonder if he might not share that thinking and theories of Dr. Gerald Callahan, a professor of immunology at Colorado State University. Callahan has written about how memories of deceased loved ones affect survivors' immune systems, and there is an essay in this collection about that. I have felt the same disdain towards all sources, from funeral home pamphlets to the self-help books that traditionally pigeonhole the grieving process into five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Sure, these are feelings the grief-stricken experience, but like any complicated process made simple, the model boils down to an incomplete, if not wrong, cultural message. Callahan's essay, Shimmer, helped me understand my complex grief much more effectively than the traditional Kubler-Ross model from her 1969 book on death and dying. In all fairness, science has begun to catch up with Pettit's and my gut feeling. An article that appeared in The New Yorker a couple of years ago re-examines Kubler-Ross's findings. The five-stage theory was first meant to be a paradigm for a person facing death, not the one left behind the dying, not the grieving. It was later that Kubler-Ross suggested the stages could be applied to the grieving process, too. The New Yorker article suggests that the stage theory of grief caught on so quickly because it made loss sound comfortable, based more on anecdotal observation than empirical evidence. Therein lays the problem. Anecdotes are spoken and shared. Most grief-stricken people I know are pretty tight-lipped about their feelings. They may confide with a family member or friend. I suspect more turn inward than reach out to a support group or counselor. If ever there was a silent majority on an American issue, I think it would be sufferers of loss who don't reach closure, who don't let go, who never stop grieving. Sufferers of loss may loop through the five stages, angry today, accepting tomorrow, or part of tomorrow, until the house cleaning is done or the sun goes down or an old favorite movie turns up on TNT. Depression almost always returns around the holidays, until a memory, Aunt Ollie gone 13 years, telling her young nephews to stop their rhythmic breathing on a family camping trip. And that transforms the negative energy to laughter around the Thanksgiving table. For a short while, Aunt Ollie's sister, who still aches over Ollie's loss, is sated with remembrance, the way turkey and all the trimmings have filled her and her family at the family feast. But then Christmas comes, or Ollie's birthday, or just the sight of her home on Main Street, inhabited by someone else's sister, and the grieving sister slumps again, hungry for, hungry for Ollie's presence year after year after year. After Dr. William Pettit called the closure theorists imbeciles, he said, I don't think many of you know it, you who have lost a parent, a child, or a friend. There's never closure. There's a hole. It's a hole with jagged edges, and over time the edges may smooth out a bit, but the hole in your heart and the hole in your soul is still there. I watched him on my TV, a late middle-aged widower, and I knew he would continue to hurt, and yet continue to, to survive with a piece of his heart missing. Perhaps adults who suffer loss should be looked at the same as children who suffer loss. When Larry died, books on how to help myself and my children through the tragedy explained that Emily and Connor would first grieve as the 11 and 13 year olds they were. Then they would grieve as older teens, then as young adults. No chapters were devoted to how I would start grieving as a 49 year old, then as a woman in my 50s, then in my 60s. I was one of 700,000 women widowed in 1998. One third of us were under 45. Most of us younger ones lost our husbands suddenly. Most of us were caring for young children. We were not our grandfathers or, grand or fathers' widows. My grandmother and mother lost their husbands later in their married lives. Their losses in, the 60s, in their 60s and 70s were no less painful than mine, but they had other widowed friends to share their losses with. Going back another generation, my great-grandmothers, widowed in, their, in the 1940s, would have been expected to become reconciled with their husband's death in two months. 
Unlike the older bereaved, most young widows have young children to support, comfort, and prepare for return to school and activities. Many of them, like me when Larry died, work full time, place their children's dinners time, homework time, and soccer practices highest in their day's priorities and are too exhausted to seek out a support group, probably overpopulated with older widows anyway. Perhaps no young widow is not an island. Very few of my coupled friends could relate to the everyday loneliness, the loneliness of my loss through the years. They may have sympathized, but they could not empathize. Most of them wanted me to hurry up and get better. For my sake, maybe. Yet they acted as if grief was contagious. They didn't want to get too close, lest they contract it. Whether they knew it or not, a few of my new millennium friends were going by the 1940s model, setting an eight-week limit on my grieving. Most of the others shared the, expected, the expectation reported in a 1989 article in the Washington Post that 85% of young widows mull over their losses for four to seven years. Now, over 20 years later, even that timetable has come into question. Researchers are coming closer to what the bereaved already know. Loss changes lives too drastically to expect its sufferers to get over it. I can't come to accept my husband died more than I can accept that over 3,000 Americans perished on September 11, 2001, or accept that over half that number did not survive Hurricane Katrina. But I can work through these private and public pains work through as in function, not as in now you feel it, now you don't. Of course, the sorrow is more difficult to work through when the tragedy is personal, but as the New Yorker article brings out, humans are programmed to grieve, just the way the dolphins Larry and I watched off the shore of California were instinctively designed to lead the remains of their kind through a ritual of mourning. There's a link. <laughs> If then, by our nature, we humans are designed to grieve, so too are most of us hardwired to function through the sadness. George A. Bonanno, a clinical psychologist at Columbia University, calls this quality resilience in his book, The Other Side of Sadness, what the new science of bereavement tells us about life after loss, published two years ago. My daughter, son, and I did not look forward to facing each day with that, Larry, but each of us eventually did look forward, even with a hole in each of our hearts. This brings me back to metaphor and to writing about Larry. When I started to put Larry's story on the page, the only story I could put on the page, all I could write was metaphor. How did I feel like these dolphins I saw in California? Well, did I use to express my grief a camping story about an encounter with a flaming red bird? I was connecting to nature more than to people. Wildlife, ocean life, these creatures knew more about mortality than anybody I knew, or so I thought. Then over a period of time, my old friends told me about, my old friend told me about the hole in her heart. Another woman I am close to, who is here tonight, told me about Papa's Day, her father's same birth and death date anniversary, which happened to also land on Veterans Day. He was a World War II vet. Someone else shared about how he once thought he saw his dead father rocking in his favorite chair. Another, how he raised his daughter alone after her mother died. Stories of loss engendered more stories of loss, one after the other, until lo and behold, my best high school friend, who's all here tonight, shared her dream about Larry with me. And my God, I used that exclamation for all it's worth. Something changed. I wrote down everything everybody told me, discovering more and more about Larry's death every time I put pen to paper, just as with this surprising burst of perception. As I learned to listen more carefully to other people and let their stories of loss lead me to discover what I had to say, something else happened. The story I was hell-bent on writing about Larry became a story about me. I didn't plan it that way, but then since Larry died, I've learned not to plan on a whole lot of things. Eventually, someone read one of my stories, the one where I kept asking myself where was Larry when I needed him, and then found out. Afterward, she took me aside to tell me her mother had been a widow for a very long time and that she never really understood her mother until she read my story. Just as I was trying to wrap my head around that, someone else read all my stories and told me that they sounded like they were about a strong, independent, and spiritual woman. You could have fooled me. Now I'm doing the fooling with all this Leno and Letterman stuff, 
but the falling feels right, and I know if Larry could read what I've written, not ready for prime time humors would be his favorite piece, because it takes something we can't control, death, and tries to lasso it with some things we can, our resilience, our reclamation of spirit, our good humor. Recently, political raconteurist John Stewart told America that sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel isn't the promised land. Sometimes it's only New Jersey. <laughs> what a hurt, and yet what truth rests in that line? In an interview with the, pres with the president, Stewart even got Obama to say that he stood for change we can believe in, but LMAO, as we say on Facebook to those who share our statuses and stories, laughing won't bring Larry back. Laughing doesn't decrease the deficit or lessen the number of soldiers who gave their lives in Iran or Afghanistan, but it gets us through to the next crisis. After 9-11, one of the surest signs that New York City was going to be okay was the first live broadcast of Saturday Night Live, 18 days after the attack. New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani opened the show by paying tribute to the lives lost on September 11th and acknowledging the members of the New York Fire and Police Departments as heroes. My heart swelled as Paul Simon sang the words, but the fighter still remains from his 70s song, The Boxer. Then guest host Reese Witherspoon told an off-color joke. A long story about a baby polar bear who kept asking Mama and Papa polar bear if he really was a polar bear over and over and over again, until Mama polar bear said, well, why do you keep asking me that? The baby polar bear replied, because I'm freezing my balls off. Lauren Michaels, the show's creator, wanted her to say, because I'm freezing my fucking balls off. He had already told her he would pay the FCC and decency fine, just so he could prove to viewers that New York City was back up and running. Witherspoon chickened out. Then, weekend update rolled around. Tina Fey brought the viewers up to SNL News Tampering Standard when she told a story about a North Carolina man who owned a Middle Eastern restaurant named Osama's Place. She reported the true news that he would change the name, that he wouldn't change the name since it was named for the original owner, not Osama bin Laden. Still, she continued, as straight-faced as any primetime news anchor, he had a hard time explaining why his other restaurant was named Hitler's Chicken. <laughs> There's something to be said for comic relief. Thank you. So what I hoped with that reading was that you see that a book about grief can also be a book about a joy, and you can laugh at it, and uh, maybe become a little political in the end, too, though uh, it's certainly more personal than it is political. Um, this is, as I said earlier, an amazing audience, and I'll never have an audience like this again. Many of you were very connected to the story that this book tells. A few of you were in the book. Uh, I don't know whether you can find yourself or not, but you are. Um, at this point, I wonder if you do have any questions about it, and I'd be glad to answer anything that you might have. I think you've listened enough. Kind of intense, huh? Don't you think? <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to if, you know if anyone does have anything to ask. When along the line did you start, did you write this book? That's a good question. Uh, how long, when did, along the way did I start writing this book? Um, as you know from my introduction, I was an English teacher at Fermi. I'm at, uh, as an untick now. Uh, English teachers are writers. They write with their classes. You know, I, I mean, there are bits and pieces of this book, the soccer story with Connor and his father, was something that I had pulled together way before. Why? Well, I pulled together when Larry was alive. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that would be an example of something that I pulled out of the past. Um, maybe a third of this book is material that I had been collecting as a family writer. Uh, maybe something appeared in the Hazardville Memorial Parent Newsletter, you know. Uh, I, you know, I can think of little pieces of things that, that did that as well, because I wrote <coughs> a piece on uh, the second graders going to the Monet Museum, or to the Monet exhibit. So when you put all that together with writing new stuff and you are um, writing linked essays, you, it pulls itself in. Um, in very surprising ways, in very surprising ways. 
there are a number of surprises in this book. I, as a teacher of writing and as a writer, um, I, I don't know how some of you might feel about this, but I always tell my writers at first they shouldn't know what they're going to say. They should discover it along the way. And that very much happened to me in the, in the writing of this book. Um, the, the last month when my thesis was going to be due, uh, I, I had never even anticipated writing an essay like the one I just read, Not Ready for Primetime Humors. But obviously I had done a lot of reading about uh, uh, widows. And uh, suddenly it was like, yeah, it's not just me. And it's not just us in this generation. And it just, it just all came together. It just all came together. And in that way, I trusted, uh, not knowing where I was going, I trusted that I would get somewhere. And that doesn't mean it didn't take a lot of revision, but, yeah. but that was a good question. Thank you. Are you working on another book right now, either essays or fiction? I, I love essay writing. Um, I did, uh, and I did blog my daughter's wedding preparations for a year uh, on a blog called Mommy of the Bride, uh, and it was great fun. It was great fun. And um, I, I think that there is uh, the possibility of a, a book in that, uh, but I'm not sure it's, it's a straight, this is Emily's wedding book. I think it it's, could be turned to fiction. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the poor kid, really. <laughs> uh, uh, I can dedicate it to you. <laughs> but I, I, am, I, I do foresee working on that. And, um, you know, I, I'm really more a, a, well, it's funny, because when I went to Western Connecticut State University in the MFA program, they said, okay, well, what do you write? And I said, I'm a short essay writer. And they said, well, unless you're talking about your height, you're not going to be a short essay writer. You know? And I was looking at them kind of funny. Because like that little segment I read about Connor uh, with the uh, Prussianism and Monet, and his father, um, to me, that was a short essay. Done. Been there. Done that. When I look at the uh, 15 to 15 to 20 page essay about Connor in this book, I realized that Really, it is five to six essays put together because they linked, because they linked. So uh, I'm always working on the little stuff, and then all of a sudden you realize that it links. All of a sudden you realize that it links. So you may see Mommy and the Bride someday, but the bride won't be called Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Or when you say that they're linked, they don't have to be linked one to two to three. Like you can oh, find no, a link no. in five. No, five. no. Yeah. Uh, you know, marketers will call my book a memoir, uh, and I, I feel as it's a memoir also. But it isn't chronologically ordered. There's an awful lot of, and to me, I mean, memoir means memory. There's an awful lot of hitting a point where your mind goes back to the past and you bring in that past and then the present becomes more meaningful and uh, uh, the future is also uh, something that keeps linking back to that, linking back to that. Um, a few of us at, at WestCon, uh, I mean, we were going crazy. We, we, you know, we wanted to complete the requirements for our degree and we were like, are we memoirists or essayists? And everybody was asking us that and it was like, a, you know what wonderful advice you said to me? Don't worry about that, just write for crying out loud. And he was right. I mean, it, 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 the question answers itself. It does. Um, but I do like the idea that each piece can stand alone. I mean, as a writer, I like that idea. I think we live in a you know, world where people don't necessarily read in complete books, so that sort of thing. But um, it becomes more meaningful when you read, the, read it all. Essays I left out of the book. Uh, I did leave one essay about why I left teaching out of the book. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because the book became so family-centered that it was extraneous. You know, I mean, I, I, to me it was a very, a very good essay. Had a lot to say about more what was happening in education and the culture. Uh, but it didn't, especially when I, when my mother passed away and I find myself, find myself writing about her, and it would have been, okay, 
I guess the essay about maybe removing. Uh, what about that wonderful essay that I did mention in that essay, Shimmer, by Gerald Callahan, which there was a whole piece on in the book. Um, and then my mother's death, and then, no, it would have been then leaving full-time teaching, and then my mother's, it just, it just didn't fit in anymore. It didn't fit in with what I saw as the vision for the book. Um, so yes, I did, I did leave that out. You know, they say writers have to kill their babies. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of good things, pieces that I wrote that I said, oh, that really doesn't fit. Oh, you know, just put it in the, go back to some other time. Mm. Any other questions? Before you were published, did you have all the essays written? Or did you well, the essays had to be written for my thesis, oh, okay. right. And uh, so, and I mean, it doesn't always happen that your thesis gets published the way the thesis was written. Uh, but um, it was complete when I started looking for a publisher. Um, I did have, you know, I, there's a, it's a small press in Florida, Signalman Press, that published this book. Um, you know, I, I marketed to big publishers for a while, and I got some very complimentary rejections. And I mean, writers love complimentary rejections. I mean, that's what they tell you to. You know, don't wallpaper your wall with the red, but just the mimeograph sheets put up those complimentary rejections. But um, frequently I was told that um, it was a story that could and should be heard, but that I didn't have uh, enough of an internet presence for, uh, for it to have uh, any effect on like, the, the publishing industry, which, I, you know, which is a totally marketing business point of view. And that's why I'm so grateful to Signalman for having published it uh, in their little small way. Uh, and it, you know, that's why it's not a hardcover and all that. But, did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Oh, okay, okay. I was never sure if I answered your questions in front of either. I don't think I did. <laughs> Tim has such an inquisitive mind. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. I wondered, I, it was a big decision to put the book out there. Uh, obviously a very personal story. Um, I certainly consulted with my children about it, uh, and from them, and I mean it was actually advisors at WestCon who were kind of saying, you know, we think this says more than uh, you might think it says, and you might want to think about it. They thought it would be good for the program, this, that, and the other, and you know, with their backing, I did. And I mean, I have received from strangers some very uh, surprising responses that have made me decide that it was the right thing to do. Okay. I just saw oh, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm done, unless anybody else has a question. I'm... Tell us where to find you on the web. Oh, okay. Yes. I have a website. I had a website crisis last night. I went to my website and was completely blank. I didn't even tell you about this yet. Yeah. And, and so I took off, you know, just host.com. What happened to my website? I'm going to do a reading tomorrow night. People are going to go and they're not going to be able to find it. And that's when I found out that, you know, some of these website suppliers, they don't really do much with technical help. It's just, uh, he was more or less saying, well, gee, I don't know. <laughs> So I said, well, do you have a backup of it someplace? And he said, oh, I think it was like a fine one. He found one for October, October 2011. I said, well, that's not too bad. It's not two years of work. And uh, I went back on, and there it was, everything that I had put on like five minutes ago. So I don't know what was that. So it should still be there. My website is www.laurabhayden, just like in the title, the B is important, uh, dot com. Um, there was another Laura Hayden mystery writer who wound up on her site. There was, and then I'll just tell you this story quickly. There was one publisher, a agent, you know, I was about to get a good agent. One agent was really interested in the book, and she emailed me and she said, Yeah, I really like this book. Uh, can I see a few more chapters? And I sent her a few more chapters, and then she went back to me and she said, Yeah, I guess I'll read the whole thing. I think this is really interesting, especially since you're that, you know, comedian on the West Coast. <laughs> Comedian on the West Coast. Well, she put a Laura Hayden up, and I'm not Laura B. Hayden. And I said, well, you know, 
Some of my friends tell me I'm pretty funny, but I'm a comedian on the West Coast. But I, you know, I, I can handle audiences. I've taught for many years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I'm not who you think I am, but this will be fine. And the next thing it was, gee, I hate to tell you, but if I didn't think you were the comedian on the West Coast, I would have never asked to look for the second batch of essays. <laughs> so, I mean, it just does go to show you, uh, marketing-wise, how crazy uh, it is, or what you need besides talent and perseverance and all that. So, uh, yeah, that kind of is kind of put it into perspective. Okay. Um, I do have a few copies here tonight because of the Martin Luther King Day non-mailing. They didn't arrive. I had ten coming today, but I do have about ten. If anyone's interested in buying a book, you can also pick up uh, a bookmark that. Um, has the uh, Kindle code on it if you would like to buy the Kindle version. And if you want a Nook version, you have to talk to me about it, and then I have to talk to somebody in the audience about it and <laughs> figure out how to do that. But uh, the book is available on Amazon also, uh, on bn.com. As Nuntik has a few copies, um, and you can order it at the Barnes & Noble in town, but I think you have to wait. How, those of you who ordered it, how long did you have to wait? About a week? A week or two. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so if you're willing to wait. And you'll have a whole bunch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. And if, you know, I don't think I'm going to run out. But if I do run out, uh, just leave me your name and email, and I will, I mean, you're all local. I'll make sure that you get a, get a book in the next week. Okay? Thank you very much. This has been great. <laughs>